Sessions bear ample testimony to the versatile genius of V. Shantaram. Rarely has the cinema, whether Indian or international, seen a filmmaker as comprehensive as V. Shantaram. <laughs> For several decades, I have tried to entertain my audience with my films. A consummate actor, an innovative editor, an insightful director, and a socially conscious producer, he went on to become one of the many legends of Indian cinema. He was an institution in his own right, an institution much larger than the institutions he built and nurtured in a lifetime which spanned the century of cinema. The Shantaram story begins a little more than a century ago. At the turn of the century on November 18, 1901, barely five years after the Lumiere brothers exhibited the first moving pictures, was born Shantaram Rajaram Vankutre. Shantaram's first brush with cinema came when his cousin and mentor, Baburao Pendhargar, took him along to the Maharashtra Film Company to meet the famed Baburao painter, who was then already a name to reckon with in the emerging realm of cinema. Shantaram was then a tall, gawky, rather serious-minded young man who had had served a brief apprenticeship in the theatre under the legendary female impersonator, Bar Gandharva. Earlier, he had also worked in a railway workshop, but had found it too dull and boring. At the Maharashtra Film Company, Shantaram was required to work behind the scenes in several departments, as well as enact minor roles in films like Surekha Haran, Simhagad, Sri Krishna Avatar, Shahala Shah, Bhakt Damaji, Maya Bazaar. Shantaram's supreme moment before the camera came when he played a young farmer caught in a vicious dead trap in Savkari Pash. The film anticipated the neo-realist style of filmmaking and is today considered a classic of early Indian cinema. It was from Babura Painter that Shantaram learned the rudiments of the film craft and soon he had carved out a reputation as someone who could creatively put a film together. In a sense, he became the first specialized film editor. Direction was a natural step forward, and Shantaram made his debut with Netaji Palkar, based on the exploits of Shivaji's trusted lieutenant. His co-director was Keshav Rao Dhaibar, the Maharashtra Film Company had given Shantaram everything, knowledge and craftsmanship, a career and a reputation. But Shantaram was fired with the zeal to do something new, something different and daring. There were others like him, three of them actually. They all wanted to start a film company of their own. There was nothing really in common between them except for the zeal to make good films. The four would-be partners were V. Shantaram, Keshavrav Dhaibar, Vishnupant Damle and S. Fatelal. The fifth to join them was their financing partner, Sitaram Kulkarni. The company they founded was the Prabhat Film Company. The date was June 1, 1929. During the silent era itself, the fledgling company made six films, all of them directed by Shantaram and Keshavrav Dhaibar. None was exceptionally different from the kind of films which were being made at that time, either in theme or technique, but Shantaram had ensured that they were all of a very high quality. One of these films was Udayakar which garnered a certain notoriety because of its problems with the then censor board, which saw in it an attempt to propagate the national movement. Barely seven films old, Shantaram took his first bold step to make a talkie. Based on the legend of King Harish Chandra, who never spoke a lie, 
the film was the first ever bilingual in Indian cinema, titled Ayodhya Ka Raja in Hindi and Ayodhya Tsa Raja in Marathi. The two versions were shot over a period of 19 days. The film was a stupendous success. That teaching course was something which very few people had the fortune to get. Understanding, helping, without nagging, with great patience, and looking at it as a matter of pride. I really was a very, very happy person in Kolapur. For their next film, the Prabhat partners took another bold step and ventured into colour. Sarandhri was based on a popular episode from the Mahabharat. The colour film was shot at the Prabhat studio in India and sent for processing at the UFA studios in Germany. But the final result was too gaudy for exhibition. It was decided to can the film. Between 1932 and 1936, Shantaram was content to tread along the well-beaten path of historicals, but with a difference. The seemingly age-old stories have an underlying core of social relevance. Manthan was a fast-moving tale of religious bigotry. The many special effects in the film included the first extreme close-up in Indian cinema, for which Shantaram imported a special lens from America. Dharmatma stars Shantaram's first guru, Bal Gandharva, as Eknath Maharaj, the social reformer who tried to abolish social inequalities. Amar Jyoti tackles the issue of women's emancipation in an implicit manner. The explosive subject matter is cloaked in a story of palace intrigue and sea pirates. In fact, Shantaram was one of the earliest filmmakers to take up the cause of women's emancipation, that too in an era of male domination. <laughs> He was aware of not only how attractive the medium was, but also its immense power. He had a tremendous visual sense and he could conjure up images in his mind's eye. He was not technically qualified, but cinema was inherent in him. Shantaram would demonstrate to his artists. The other partners also made films, but would never act out a scene. But these initial years were only a preparation for the final glorious half a decade to come, 1937 to 42, when three of the finest films of social relevance would emerge from Prabhat, placing the company on the national map and consolidating Shantaram's reputation as the greatest Indian director of pre-independence India. The first of the films was Kunku in Marathi and Dunyana Mane in Hindi, which centers around a May-December second marriage. Keshav Rao Date played the aging husband who dares to marry a sprightly young girl played by Shanta Apte, who refuses to give in to his demands to consummate the marriage preferring to suffer social scorn and injustice. The film narrates her struggle to survive this unequal match honorably through the relationships she develops with other members of the household. Kunku Madli Ji Naika hai, 
The heroine's struggle for her rights is so impressive that there is no equivalent for it in the movement for women's emancipation. Shantaram would strive endlessly to get the visual effect he wanted. In Kunku, he used multiple mirror images mocking the protagonist to signify social scorn. Shantaram's next film, Manus in Marathi, an Admi in Hindi, was made to counter the wave of romantic depression sweeping the youth of the country following the popularity of Barua's Devdas. The film is the story of an honest policeman's attempts to rehabilitate a prostitute by proposing marriage to her. However, confronted by his mother's sincere simplicity and deep religiosity, she runs away. Very soon, her past catches up with her and she is sentenced to death for the murder of her tormentor. But for the honest policeman, life must go on. <laughs> For the first time, a prostitute was shown to have a human face. The manus of the title applies to not only the male characters, but also the prostitute. At a time when most filmmakers were toying with improbable tales, Shantaram had instinctively realized that the need of the R was socially relevant stories which explored the real world around him. His story selection was impeccable and his scripting faultless. He was very particular about the stories he selected. He wanted to make films with both class and mass appeal. A powerful story was once again the heart of his next venture, Shezari in Marathi and Padosi in Hindi. Written by the legendary stage and film director Vishram Bedekar, the story focuses on two close friends, a Hindu and a Muslim, who represent communal harmony and indeed the well-being of the village which is torn asunder when the two quarrel. Given the social and political climate of the country, it was a huge risk to take, but the film opened to rave reviews. There was no denying the raw power of the core of the film, the Hindu-Muslim relationship, which makes the theme as fresh today as it was more than half a century ago. The dam in Shezari is barely five to six feet high. He first visualized the scene completely before shooting it. A closer viewing of the Prabhat films suggests that the young Shantaram was evolving a new style of filmmaking and a new grammar of Indian cinema. The themes were fresh, the scripting style was terse, the visuals were crisp and the films themselves slick. Consequently, each film bore a look that was different from the general rut of films being then made, a look that began to be recognized as the Prabhat stamp. 
It was all a matter of team spirit. But Shantaram was like fire. Live fire. Over the years, many critics have attributed this Prabhat stamp to the sole cinematic genius of Shantaram. This claim is patently unfair to the other partners who made an equally creative contribution in the making of the films, though they were not as much in the limelight as Shantaram was. There was a decided camaraderie between the partners, particularly on creative matters, since they were all fired with the zeal of making the best films. He would consult Damli like an elder brother. Once Damli sat up all night to repair the recording machine. The next morning, Shantaram saw him dripping with sweat and hugged him. He has written about this in his autobiography. On holidays, the partners would sit and discuss potential stories for their future films. Or they would go and see a film and discuss what they could learn from it. This went on till Chesari. Three classics in half a decade had made Shantaram invincible at the box office. But the time had come to part ways. Shantaram's cinematic genius could not be contained at Prabhat. He began to think of new vistas to conquer. Though the partnership was worth much more, he agreed to take a token amount so as not to disrupt the finances of the organization he had helped to build and strengthen. Once he had withdrawn from Prabhat, Shantaram realized he could not continue to live in Pune. There was no charm in it. The only property he had to his name was a small theater in Mumbai, Plaza, which he had once bought with his own money. He decided to go to Mumbai, which had grown into the film capital of India. There, he would begin life afresh. The studio was set up in 1942 and called Raj Kamal after my grandparents, Rajaram and Kamal. In a quick about turn from his last three films made at Prabhat, he chose a subject from Indian mythology, the legend of Shakuntala. The film went on to become a stupendous hit, so much so that even when he had completed his next two films, Shakuntala was still running in Mumbai. Parbatte Apna Dera tells the story about the repressed sexuality of a saint who has tasted the pleasures of the flesh. Raj Kamal's third venture, Dr. Kotneski Amar Kahani, told the true story of a Sholapur doctor who had volunteered to go on a medical mission to China after he had heard Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru speak at a public rally. Working quickly, he assembled a cast of look-alike actors and cast himself as Dr. Kotnis after noticing in himself a remarkable resemblance to the late doctor. Jai was cast in the role of the Chinese nurse Ching Lang, who eventually marries him. With success resounding from all corners of the country, Shantaram felt it was now time to take his films to a wider audience. He planned a trip to the United States where he hoped to commercially exploit his films. While he was away, he requested his guru Baburao Painter to direct a bilingual. 
लोक शाहिर राम जोशी इन मराठी एंड मतवाला शायर राम जोशी इन हिंदी The film was based on a script written by G. D. Madgurkar on the 19th century Brahmin poet Ram Joshi, who had devoted himself to the folk art of tamasha and the writing of lavani, a bawdy form of romantic poetry, only to be ostracized by his community. The U.S. trip did not go exactly as planned, but Shantaram did get leading American distributors Meyer and Burstyn interested in his films. Both Shakuntala and Dr. Kotnis had been received well in America. It was now 1948. Shantaram had suffered a string of losses, and yet he felt it was time to think about the country rather than mere commerce. बच्चों के कपड़े, घर का सामान, बीवी का देवर, सब कुछ ले Black marketing, black money, and corruption were rampant. Shantaram's next venture, Apna Desh, struck the right chord in the hearts of the people, and the film was a super hit. It was also remade in Tamil as Nama Nadu. This success encouraged Shantaram to tackle another social evil. Chandan! The Hedge tells the story of a father who allows himself to be financially and emotionally ruined for the sake of his daughter's marital happiness. Here was a story straight from the headlines of every newspaper. As expected, the film opened to rave critical and popular acclaim. Pitaji, in the Hedge, लेकिन एक चीज तो देना भूल ही गए कफन The films of the 1950s were a mixed bag. There were the flops like Parchai, Surang, and Subah Ka Tara, but then there were also hits. Amar Bhupali, written by Vishram Bedekar and Chintaman Marathe, was set in the fading years of the Peshwa reign and told of the noted Marathi poet Hona Ji Bala. Amar Bhupali had all the qualities of a Shantaram film: a spellbinding story, lilting music, good performances, everything that makes for solid box office returns and critical acclaim. More importantly, it brought into Shantaram's life Vijaya, the 18-year-old daughter of the Marathi and Gujarati stage actor Shridhar Deshmukh. Shantaram renamed her Sandhya. Sandhya would also play the mystery girl in Tin Batti Char Rasta. Sandhya endeared herself to Shantaram when she willingly came forward to don a dark makeup for the role. The film told the story of a family with five daughters-in-law from different provinces living together. <laughs> When Shantaram began casting for Janak Janak Pail Baje, he had already signed Gopi Krishna for the male lead. and shantaram was confident that sandhya would match him step for step hum is gop gowala kehte hain hum is gop gowala kehte hain aur krishna diya hai naam hame naam hame 
the film tells of how a disgraced dance guru Mangal Maharaj trains his son and a female partner to bag the top award at a prestigious annual dance performance. The story is paper thin and actually an excuse to unleash an extravaganza of exquisite song and dance. is undoubtedly the zenith of Shantaram's filmmaking career. Here again was a story to test Shantaram's caliber, a fine blend of entertainment with social commitment. Written by G.D. Madgurkar, the film is based on a true life incident which took place in the small kingdom of Aund in pre-independent India. It tells of an idealistic jailer who's given permission to try out his concept of open jail reform on six hardened criminals and how he keeps them together with sheer moral force. Reminiscent of vintage Shantaram, the film became an instant hit. Not only did it sweep the national awards, it bagged the Golden Bear, the top award at the Berlin Film Festival. At the same festival, it bagged a special prize of the International Catholic Cinematographic Bureau. His Holiness the Pope also conferred on it the Catholic Award. The Hollywood Press Association conferred on it the Samuel Goldwyn International Film Award for the best foreign film. While the film garnered one accolade after another, Shantaram was almost on the verge of losing his eyesight. My eye was grievously injured while fighting a bull for the last scene of Do Aankhe Bara Haat. I thought I would lose my eyesight forever. My eyes are all right now, but when I lay in bed with my eyes bandaged, I saw in my mind's eye the many colors of life. Today, I want to share a few of these colors with you. Navrang, again, was a film in the Shantaram mold. Set in the fading years of the British Raj, the film is a wonderful detailing of pre-colonial Indian lifestyle. A simple story of a poet who imagines his simple wife to be the girl of his dreams leading to marital misunderstanding is greatly aided by C. Ramchandra's music. With Navrang, Shantaram entered a brand new phase of spectacular entertainers with an overdose of songs and dances. Stri, Sehra, Geet Gaya Patharone, Boon Jo Bangai Moti and Jal Bin Machli Nritya Bin Bijli. Geet Gaya Patharone introduced Rajashri and Jitendra to the film industry. Both were destined to become major Hindi film stars in the 1960s and 1970s. By the sheer law of averages, Shantaram was gearing up for another hit. The project was suggested by director Anant Mani. Pinzara, in Marathi, 
tells the story of an idealistic schoolmaster who is seduced by a tamasha dancer and who is eventually accused of his own murder. In a sense, he feels that he has indeed killed the idealistic schoolmaster in him and so pleads guilty to the charge. It is a film which had the right mix of narrative, social flavor and opportunity for song and dance. I had heard that Shantaram gave detailed instructions to his actors and expected them to be followed minutely. This had scared me. But in the very first meeting, he confessed that he gave minute instructions to his actors because most of them were untrained. In your case, I expect you to work on your own character. I was greatly relieved to hear this. <laughs> Shantaram's next ambitious project, Chani, flopped. And Shantaram did not make a film for more than a decade. He was now 75 years old and in indifferent health. But there was the promise he had made to his grandson, Sushant, that he would launch him as a leading man. Sushant had played child roles in many of Shantaram's recent films. Janjhar was launched with Sushant and Padmini Kolhapure, loosely based on Shantaram's silent film Jalti Nishani. The film was too outdated in theme and style. Shantaram did not make any films after Janjhar. In a career spanning a phenomenal 79 years, Shantaram directed 43 films, of which more than half were bilinguals an output which is unrivaled in the history of cinema. cinema. Cinema for him was a way of life. He would involve not only his crew members, but everyone around him in the process of filmmaking. Probably Shantaram's greatest contribution as a director was that he understood the role of the various technicians and blended them into making of the film more so the craft of editing. Not only was he India's first professional editor, but was probably the best. He could edit a film after it had been edited, irrespective of whether he had participated in the script writing or attended the shooting. He was a master technician. master technician. Shantaram had the best technicians working towards the making of the film, but he himself was the master technician who could orchestrate his technicians at the mere swing of the baton. One has to have a strong grasp on the grammar and mechanics of cinema to be able to lead a creative team at the height of its creative powers. Besides creativity, he was a very far-sighted man. He had a director. And as a filmmaker, he was absolutely 100% filmmaker. Right from the beginning, it was obvious that Shantaram, the director, was something special. There are many films which do not carry his name, but his stamp is unmistakable. His films had what has often been described as the Shantaram touch. He uses minute details to reveal a larger social truth. It is important to decodify these details. And he, Attaji. I'm 
छोड़कर जा रहे हो उसे पूरा करके ही वापस आओ These symbols, which are an inseparable part of his narrative strategy and storytelling, indicate the idealism of the era and society in which the films were created. Song picturization was a special area of attention for Shantaram. But it was not merely genius which made Shantaram a master of cinema. A lot of disciplined hard work also went into the films he crafted. Many people felt he was too strict and humorless. But had it been so, he could not have directed the so many sensitive and emotional films. A grateful nation conferred on him a whole host of awards from the Dada Saheb Phalke Award in 1986 to the Padma Vibhushan in 1992. But the award he prized the most was undoubtedly the doctorate he was awarded by the Nagpur University in 1980. In Shantaram, cinema found the ideal mix of art, commerce and technology. His grasp over technology and technique may have been exceptionally strong because he witnessed the growth and development of cinema technology. After all, he had been born with the medium itself and strode across it like a colossus for almost the entire century. Shantaram passed away on October 30, 1990. His was an extraordinary life, but he never forgot that he was an ordinary man, a man of the people, a man of God. As the poet said, <laughs> Hey, Malik, Tere Bande 